Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that we can look to your word that is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and change our lives today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of dysfunction <clears throat> in our world today, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, dysfunction surrounds uh, many families. Uh, dysfunction is uh, certainly uh, something that uh, we want to try to rid ourselves of. Uh, dysfunction, uh, it says, dysfunction, the definition is not performing normally uh, or malfunctioning. And so that's what we're talking about, dysfunction. And it's an epidemic when you think of it in our society. Uh, dysfunctional families. Uh, dysfunction is all around us. Uh, the, uh, just the tragedies with drugs and overdoses and deaths and addictions. But it's not just that. Uh, we have dysfunction. People uh, maybe love money and not God. That's dysfunction. Uh, we have uh, people that are doing real well in life. They don't even see their need for God. The, what we want people to see is there's a way out of our dysfunction. So dysfunction, it says, is not functioning normally <clears throat> or malfunctioning. And uh, just like a car, if you buy a new car and you drive it home and it doesn't start and you wonder what on earth is wrong with this car, you can bring it back. Uh, they'll fix it. Then you bring it back home, and the next day it doesn't start again. If it keeps doing that, that's a dysfunctional car, isn't it? Anyone know what I'm talking about? And that's dysfunctional. And we have laws uh, that pertain to that. What is it called? The lemon law. Uh, you can bring that car back after so many times and, and say, hey, listen, this just doesn't work. I want a new one. Unfortunately, that doesn't work with humans. And, and so, uh, you know, you... You get this little baby, and God, it cries all night long. Uh, it's malfunctioning. Could I get another one, right? Uh, or this one just beats up his sister all the time. Could I get another one? God, I really have a problem. They're teenagers, and something has malfunctioned, and it's just terrible. Can I get another one? It doesn't happen, does it? But you know what God does do? He'll give us a brand new heart. And he'll change us. And that's defunct dysfunction is because God created us perfectly in his image. But he gave us that little thing called free will. And when we sinned, dysfunction entered this world. And that's what sin is all about. It's dysfunction. And it hits every home, every family, every individual. And so as we're looking at this today, we want to <clears throat> really pray that God would speak to our hearts. Uh, there's a way out of our dysfunction, and uh, you'll see that through God's Word and what I'm about to share with you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms 107. I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful chapter that really <clears throat> explains some important things about real-life situations. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Anyone? Amen. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then it says, then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. And our enemy is the devil. And God has redeemed us from the enemy. Aren't you glad? And, and if you've been redeemed, it says, tell others. That's why we, I've been sharing my testimony since I was in eighth grade when I became a Christian. We need to tell others the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And it's real clear. <clears throat> it's real clear. Tell others he's redeemed you. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. I want you to get that picture of people in our own city. They wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. They have no clue, no direction. Hungry and thirsty, they nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Very interesting. When they were in their distress, they called out to the Lord. 
So often when people are in their in distress or in trouble, they start thinking about God. I don't, you've probably never seen this movie. It's with Burt Reynolds, I believe. And he was swimming. He was out in the ocean and was distraught. And whether he was committing suicide or he, or he wanted to end his life or it was an accident, I can't remember the whole story. All I remember is seeing him under the water and all of a sudden he has this, I want to live. And he starts going to the top, going to the top, and he bursts through the water. I want to live, God. I want to live. Then he looked at shore, and the shore seemed like it was miles away. And he started making a deal with God. God, I'll give you 90%. I'm talking 90% of everything I have. It's yours. Just get me back to shore. Give me 90%. And he gets a little closer, closer to the shore. He says, you heard me, God, 60%. If you just get me back to shore, I'll give you 60%. He's a few blocks out. God, 20%, I promise. I'll give you 20%. He's almost there, 10%, I promise. And he gets on shore, and there I think is Danny DeVito is ready to kill him. God, 90%, and he's back at it. So, so that's what we do sometimes. In our, by the way, anyone see that movie? One person, two people. <laughs> anyway, it, it was a funny movie. But it talks about it's really li how life is. When we're in trouble, we call out to the Lord. We want God to help us when we're in distress. And the wonderful thing to know is God hears our prayers. He hears our prayers. Then it goes on in the chapter. The psalmist says, Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, imprisoned in iron chains of misery. I want you to consider those words just for a minute. They sat in darkness in the deepest gloom in their misery. That verse reminded me of my home growing up and, and how my mother was in, in this darkness. Our house was dark. Uh, when, you're in deep, when you're depressed, you want to be in darkness. You close the drapes. Our house, the drapes were always closed, uh, filled with smoke. You'd see billowing in the air with the little stream of light coming through. That's the, the situation many people are in in our communities, and we don't even know it because nowadays we don't even know our neighbors. Hello? Is that true? We hardly know our neighbors today. We, we don't know what's going on in their life. We don't know if they're going through heartache. We don't know if they're going through trial. Uh, and we need to get to know people so we can minister hope to people. There are so many people, we don't even have a clue how many kids are going home to darkness and gloom, and they hate even going into their home. They don't know if their parents will be there tonight. They don't know if they'll be fighting. They don't know if their mother will overdose. They don't know if dad's even alive, some of them. That's the darkness and the gloom that we're talking about. And if the church doesn't do something to reach these people, nobody will. And there's an answer. And here, this person, these people in darkness, gloom, it's chains, we're holding them, all of this. And uh, they were in their distress. Uh, the iron chains of misery. That's what people are in, and they want to they wanna just cover that misery up by taking drugs and more drugs, uh, by uh, covering their, uh, trying to somehow uh, hiding their pain or covering their, uh, taking care of that pain in a way where they can't think. And they, they rebelled against the words of God, scorning the counsel of the Most High. That is why he broke them with hard labor. They fell, and no one was able to help them up. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, a reoccurring theme here, and he saved them from their distress. Aren't you glad that God hears our prayers? Even though we don't deserve it, God hears our prayers. He snapped their chains. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Our, our family was in chains of bondage. And God broke those chains. Many of you can relate to that, uh, no matter what your bondage was. The devil, <clears throat> it says in John 10.10, 10, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's why people are in their darkest gloom. He hates people. He wants to do anything. He either wants you to be happy so you don't need God, or so distressed that you turn from God. He doesn't want you to call out on God. And that's what the enemy does. I can't imagine somebody being so unbelievably evil. But the devil is nothing but evil. 
There is no good in him. There's nothing good about him, and he hates you and your family. He hates us. He wants you to end your marriages. He wants you to end your lives. He'll do anything he can uh, to destroy us. But God has a better plan. And that's why it says Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. I'm so, so glad he came to my family. Some were fools. They rebelled and suffered for their sins. They rebelled and they suffered for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food and they were knocking on death's door. That's the situation of some people in life. They've rebelled against God. Maybe they've turned away from God. Maybe they were raised in a Christian home, just like the prodigal son. And then they were at death's door. They had no food. That man was eating the corn the pigs were eating when he left his family and turned from God. That's what happens when you turn from God and, and you get lost in sin. They suffer for their sins. They couldn't stand the thought of food and they were knocking on death's door. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. Oh, I'm so glad God hears us when we're in our trouble, aren't you? Lord, help, they cried in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. We have to teach our children to cry out to God all the time to teach them to turn from the sin before it gets too late. <clears throat> he sent his word and he healed them. He snatched them from the door of death. Aren't you glad God does that? He snatches us from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. That's why we worship the Lord here, because of what he's done for us, uh, because what he's set us free from. He's delivered us from our sin. Don't go back into that. Stay away from that. Uh, then he tells us another story, the psalmist. Some went off in the, in, uh, to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. Anybody been on, on a boat where a storm came up and you were in distress? It's not a fun feeling, is it? And I want to tell you something. You can just see that in that psalmist writing. They, their boat went up to the heavens and it plunged to the depths and they couldn't even see anything around them in that storm. That's sometimes how people feel in the storms of life. They can't see any way out of their problem. Uh, it, the storms are all around them. And that's what this is telling us. Their ships were tossed to the heavens. Then they plunged to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards were, and were at their wit's end. So many people in life are at their wit's end. That's why there's so much suicide. That's why there's so much, so, so, so many addictions. That's why all of these things are just uh, tearing at society because people come to the place they're at their wit's end. Maybe you've never been there, but there are millions of people in our society that are at their wit's end. Where is the church to help? And that's where we have to be to help when they're at their wit's end. They don't know which way to go. They don't know what to do. There is no answer for them in sight. And we have the answer, and we have to tell them what that answer is. Because Jesus can set them free when they're at their wit's end. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. I hope you believe it. That's what we have to get out there. That's what we have to share with people. That's what the world needs to hear. That's what you need to hear. Today, they were at their wit's end. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper. And he stilled the waves. I remember when my mother was at her wit's end. I remember when we were at our wit's end. I remember the trauma in our home. And I remember after Jesus rescued us, <clears throat> it 
that he's calmed the storm and there was peace like that whisper, that gentle whisper. What a difference when God intervenes in a family. They were at their wit's end. Lord help, they cried, and he heard them, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to whisper, filled the way, he stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nations. God wants Christians to come out of the closet. Everyone else is. It's about time we do, isn't it? <laughs> and so God wants Christians to come out of the closet. He wants us to go public with our love and adoration for Jesus Christ. That's what God wants for you and for me. Instead of being silent Christians, he wants us to be wonderful, bold Christians, not in an obnoxious manner, but in a loving manner, telling others about our great God. We look at these beautiful examples, and then I'll have you just verse 41. He says, he rescues the poor from their trouble. He increases their families like flocks of sheep. The godly will see these things and be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise, very important verse, those who are wise will take heart, all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. Those who are wise. If you're wise today, and if you're not a Christian, you'll take this to heart. If you are a Christian, you'll take, still take this to heart. Uh, you'll, you'll start sharing more fervently the love of Jesus with those who don't know him. You'll, every Sunday, make an effort to bring others who need him to church because that's what God has called the church to do, not to have a little nice social club here. He's called us to be a light to a dark world. And what a beautiful thing. It says, those who are wise will take this to heart. Well, dysfunction is all around us. And... We know that when sin entered the world, even the first family, as I mentioned, when sin entered the world, that's when dysfunction came. And dysfunction is an epidemic. That's when dysfunction came to Adam. God created this family to be just like him, to live forever in righteousness and holiness with their God. But they sinned. They turned from their God. They rebelled. Then they had dysfunction. <clears throat> One brother killing another brother. That's dysfunction, isn't it? Greed, jealousy, bitterness, hatred, all of these things coming in. But God wasn't happy with their dysfunction. And that's why he sent Jesus to change us. There's a good plan he has. There's a good plan. He he wants to give us a new heart and a new life and a brand new start. I look back at my life, and I'm not going to have time. We have books for each one of you as you leave today, but I'm going to share some things with you um, about the story of God's redemption in my own personal life. Most of you have heard parts of that. <clears throat> we grew up in Kenwood on West Toledo Street until I was five years old, and my mother... Um, was she married my father. Uh, she was from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and she married my father and thought that he was the prince on the white horse that's going to grab her and take her and give her a new life because my mother grew up in dysfunction as well. You see, that's what Satan wants, is he wants uh, it go from one generation to the next, this dysfunction, and he wants it to keep going from one generation to another dysfunction, sin, divorce, addictions. That's what Satan wants. And so my mother's mother had all kinds of problems. My grandmother uh, with, with addictions, all of the different things. She uh, had my mother leave her home as a young girl. My, other, my mother only finished eighth grade. Uh, she was shipped from one boarding home to another boarding home to try to uh, have somebody that would take care of her and show her love. Uh, she was raped uh, different times in her life and all those pains and scars in her life 
and the pain she struggled, and I'm not going into detail, but just the horrendous life she had, forced to have an abortion as a young girl when she was raped and got pregnant, all of the things she experienced. And then she meets my dad, and, uh, and she thinks things are going to be better. Things are going to be better. And they moved to Duluth. My dad was a boilermaker. He paid the bills. He, he was... Um, he did a lot of good things, hard worker, uh, but he was addicted to alcohol. And that addiction caused a lot of dysfunction in our home. And my mother tried her hardest. I didn't realize uh, my sister Paula, when I asked my mother permission to write the book, I didn't want to hurt her or defame her in any way. And she said, if it helps bring anyone to Jesus, you write that book, and believe me, it's helped a lot of people come to know Jesus by God's grace. One young girl took the book and read it, and she gave it to her mother. After she read it, she gave her heart to Jesus. Her mother gave her heart to Jesus. Then they gave it to her grandmother, and she gave her heart to Jesus. Pretty exciting what God can do. And that's why I'm in the ministry, because there's a God in heaven who sees our dysfunction, and he sent his son to die on the cross to bring us back into that right relationship with God. That's what reconciliation is. And so <clears throat> my mother, hoping uh, to be functional in this relationship, Paula said uh, she saw her getting more and more depressed at home. I couldn't remember it. I was only around three years old. And that's when my mother had her first nervous breakdown uh, after she got married. And my sister said she saw her try to kill herself in Kenwood. And, and they brought her home uh, to the hospital, and she was saved by God's grace. And, and then my parents moved down to... The hillside, and we grew up on 8th Avenue East and or 8th Street and 3rd Avenue East, right up from First Press Church, uh, six blocks. Um, and that's where we were living. My dad wasn't home a lot, he had to work out of town a lot. When he did come home, my mother prepared such nice candlelight dinners for him, and, and she'd call him down at one of the bars that he would frequent. And I, I knew the numbers by heart, believe me. I knew everyone, Molostans, Normans, all of the different bars downtown to call to try to find my parents. That's not good. Uh, you know, and my, especially when they're out too late. It should be the parents worrying about the kids. But it, it was reversed in our family. Us kids were worrying about our parents. Where are they? When are they going to be home? Are they okay? All of those things. And so uh, it was growing up in that kind of uh, atmosphere and um, my, my mother, in her distress, of course, uh, when my dad wouldn't come home, she cried, wanted him home. He'd come home finally. He'd be drunk, and the fighting would start. And every weekend we knew that the fighting would begin every time my dad would be home. And my mother couldn't get him to stop drinking. She wanted to be with him, so she went out to the bars with him. She could not handle alcohol in any way. And when she would come home at night, she, my dad would be passed out. I can still see the green matching chairs and a, a cigarette holes, and he'd be burning the holes. My mother would be panicking. She'd have panic attacks. She'd fall on the floor, hyperventilate, cry out, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I was kids, don't die, Mommy, don't die. And just the turmoil. And this was a recurring theme in our home on weekends and the heartache that we're experiencing. And you might wonder, well, what purpose does this have to even tell people about it? The purpose is that there are people that have it worse than I had it, and we don't even know them. We don't even know what they're experiencing. We don't know the darkness and gloom that they're experiencing in their homes. And that's who we have to reach, these people locked in chains of darkness and gloom. They could be a fellow student at school. They could be a fellow employee. We don't know because people cover it up pretty good. They cover it up, right? They're embarrassed of their shame. They're embarrassed. They don't know who to talk to. When my basketball coach read my book, he said, Thor, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I knew you were a little dysfunctional, but I can't believe that you went through this. I knew you had a hard family life, but see, we don't know. And then all of this darkness and gloom and the fighting would ensue and 
and, and then it would get a little better for a while, and my mom would get a little better, and, and, but each weekend, all, my two twin brothers, I have two older sisters, Paula and Joni, and two younger brothers, uh, they're twins, identical twins, Henry and Paul. I'm in the middle, uh, and I tell them I'm the most balanced in the family. <laughs> but regardless, uh, so we have our family, uh, and, and these, these we would, my sister was more like a mother than a sister, and, and she kind of tried to keep things going at our home. And I cared for my brothers. They're five years younger, and I, they were always on my heart that they were okay because there was really no supervision. And, and so things got worse. My mother was going to divorce my dad, and, of course, I was bitter towards her. I was getting more and more bitter uh, as uh, the, the years went on. And, and <clears throat> by the time I was 12, I was full of rebellion. She'd ask me to do something. I'd just curse and say, do it yourself, and just full of this rebellion. My friends at school wouldn't let me hang. Their parents wouldn't let me hang out with them. They uh, said that I was a hood. Anyone remember that name? And, and so a hood, stay away from Thor. I, I was so feel, I wanted to have black, everything. I wanted a black clothes, black leather coat. I wanted to dye my hair black, and it was so blonde back then. And, but black, because we were filled in our house with darkness. That's what it was all, darkness. And so uh, as things got worse, we didn't know what to do. <clears throat> and um, my mother divorced my father, and I remember, remember him leaving that day. It was the first time I saw my dad cry. And see, that's dysfunction. You're not supposed to see that as a kid. See your dad pack up that brown metal suitcase. I still see him packing his suitcase and crying as he left the house. And um, the heartache in the home. And then my mother thought it would get better, but it didn't get better. And uh, she started going out to the bars more and more and, and coming home and <clears throat> the same stress, but now dad wasn't drinking with her. He was gone, living down in the hillside. Uh, above, uh, he lived above the Apollo bar for years and just in, in, in all of this. And, and you're so blinded to your dysfunction. I remember as we did an intervention for my dad once, we went and we had this man come with us and my sister Paula and I went there and Dad, we have somebody to meet you. Who are you? And he didn't want him there. But I said, this is a friend of ours, and we just wanted to talk to you. And, well, come on in, my dad said. We went into the room, and, and my dad, uh, he said, you know, Bob, I hear you a boiler maker. Yeah, I'm a boiler maker. That's good. You make good money in that, don't you? He said, yeah, we make pretty good money. And he said, is this all you have to show for it, Bob? And that room, I tell you, it stunk like a urinal. And that was a shared urinal down the hall. He had a little sink in the corner, a little bed here, and a dresser. And he said, that's a pretty nice place. That's how blinded you can be to your dysfunction, uh, to, to your situation. It becomes normal, dysfunction does. So you don't realize how abnormal it is. And finally... He talked to him about going to treatment, and my dad swore at him, told him, get out of here. And, of course, Paul and I felt bad. We couldn't help him, and it went on like that, trying to help him. My mother got worse, uh, and, and just the terrible thing is she locked herself in the door, and she would cry and hyperventilate, call my mom, I'm dying, I'm dying, and we'd cry, don't die, Mommy. And uh, one night she uh, locked herself in the bathroom door and took razor blades with her, and I had to kick the door down, and... There she was lying on the floor with the razor blade sl slitting her wrist and I'm holding and crying out and we call the paramedics and they come, put her in a straight jacket and take her away. And those were things that we experienced growing up as children, the heartache. And there was no way out. Talk about being at your wit's end. And if you're in education and you see kids acting up, believe me, there's a reason mostly why they're acting up. There's things happening in their life that are maybe really bad, and that's why we have an opportunity to make a difference and in our churches to make a difference. My mother was brought to St. Luke's psych ward, and I remember going there. Well, 
walking in there, and it was just a terrible experience, but we got to visit our mom, and mom, it's me, Thor, and I went down and hugged her, and she didn't say anything, and I just looked in her eyes, and it was black, stare, a catatonic state. She didn't speak a word, and we left there just with no hope, no hope. There are so many people in this world with no hope. But God intervenes. I'm so glad I had somebody praying for me. My aunt Elaine prayed for our family. She prayed a lot. Don't stop praying for your family. For the people that are lost in their sin. And <clears throat> after my dad left, I got worse. But finally, because I love basketball, there was a church that had a gymnasium in Central Hillside, just like, and that's why we have a gymnasium, so we can touch the lives of people. And God did a wonderful work. And I met a man that uh, he went to a Urbana, Illinois, a missions conference, and they said, God wants you to be a missionary in your own home in your own communities, and he prayed for five junior high kids to give their lives to Jesus by August 1st, 1968. And that's when I met this man. He said, you want to play a game of four horses? We shot around and played. He said, how would you like to come to a Bible study? I said, no way. My parents make me go to church. They stay in bed with hangovers. I'm not going to a Bible study. And he said, we'll play basketball first. I said, okay, I'll come. And invited my friends. And we read together in the book of Romans. I'd never read the Bible. But I could relate to sin, and Romans talks a lot about sin. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and I knew that. I knew I was a sinner. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God showed his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I am so glad he suffered for us so we could be made whole. And then in Romans 6, 23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We're reading these verses, and we met for probably 10 nights in a row. The third night, I remember getting on my knees and asking Jesus to come into my heart and to forgive my sin and be my Lord and Savior. God did exactly that. I didn't know what it meant to be born again. I didn't know what the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are new. What a beautiful thing. I didn't know those, but I felt brand new walking home that night in that latter part of July, 1968. When I got home, my mother said, are you on drugs or what? And I said, no, I became a Christian tonight. She said, it won't last. I tried it when I was a kid. That was 48 years ago. It's lasted a long time. <clears throat> Things got worse and not better. And God was still there. As we begin to pray, my sisters, you know, they, you're not a Christian. You just swore. And I was so upset. I swear, swear again. And just uh, still battling. My twin brothers both gave their heart to Jesus the same night I told my mother about receiving Christ. Henry's been a missionary to Brazil. My brother Paul works in, the, he's a chemical dependency counselor. My sister Paula married the guy that invited me to a Bible study. They've served on the Crow Indian Reservation for years. Uh, um, just a wonderful story of what God can do in a family. My mother took her two years, but she came home out of Norman's Bar the same night. Two women asked her to be a prostitute. She said, good grief, I drink, that's bad enough. And as she sat at the bar... Uh, she heard the voice, go home to your children. She hit the guy next to her in the arm, said, don't tell me to go home to my kids. I'm a good mother. He said, I didn't tell you anything. She argued the fact, stayed there another five minutes, heard the voice again, go home to your children. She went home that night and gave her heart to Jesus. And I want to tell you, there had never been peace like that in my home before. That's what God can do. And I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute. Rolling down my cheek 
Thank you for showing that the Duluth Masters Commission. They like to share that in some of the schools they go to, some of the their youth meetings they go to around our state. My father had religion. My mother, after she received Jesus, was a different person. There was peace in our home. God calmed the storm. My dad, when I talked to him about Jesus, he'd just say, shut up. He said, I've got my religion. His religion never did anything to change the way he lived. A lot of people have religion. There's a lot of religions in the world, but Jesus changes us from the inside out. And Jesus is the only way to the Father. I prayed for my dad for 25 years. And they were long, arduous years, believe me, because I was so concerned about my dad going to heaven. I was concerned about my grandpa Thor going to heaven. I was able to talk with him, and he showed me the little track that my Aunt Elaine gave him, the sinner's prayer. He says, Thor, I pray that every night. And, and I believe I'll see my grandpa again. My dad, in his stubbornness, uh, he finally quit drinking because it was destroying his life, and that was an answer to prayer. So he quit drinking at age 66. <clears throat> he died when he was 76. He was a dry drunk for seven years. Quitting drinking didn't change his life. It made it a better life, but it didn't change his life. He still needed Jesus. And three years before he died, he was in the hospital calling out for help, dying. My pastor went to see him when I was a youth pastor. My pastor went to see him, and my dad received Jesus into his heart to be his Lord and Savior. God healed him. He had three wonderful years with his family. 
he used to come and sit in the little white church. I didn't know if he heard anything I said. <clears throat> Joanne Eastful said, I love seeing your dad here. And I said, I'm not sure if he hears anything I say. And she said, oh, he hears. I said, how do you know? She said, I see the tears coming down his cheeks. When my dad <clears throat> was dying of cancer, my mother was there holding his hands. They'd been divorced for years. She was telling him how much she loved him. And he always said, I love you too, Janie. And he loved my mother. And God healed our family. There was restoration. There was forgiveness. And my dad, someday again, I'll see in heaven. My mother, because of Jesus Christ. This is the hope the world needs, church. This is what we all need. Maybe you've had religion. Maybe things are going well for you and you don't see your need for a Savior. That's where Satan wants a lot of people too. Doing well, everything's good, I'm making money. We all need Jesus, we all need a Savior, and we all need to tell others about him. And so today as we close, I'd like to just uh, pray for you and like to just encourage you to keep telling others about our wonderful Savior, bringing them with you to church and loving them into God's kingdom. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer.